everyone, and welcome to this month's presentation. We're going to be talking about the herb number two mine, and I call this the land of giants. And what we'll learn about tonight is that the herb number two is called the land of giants because of the incredible size of some of the mineral specimens that were discovered here. Just the pure quality and the record-breaking size of some of these specimens, not just for Virginia, not just for the U.S., but the entire continent of North America, have actually been found here at the herb number two. In the background, we can see two, uh, two vehicles and a collector back in the woods. This was a collecting that was done in the early 1990s, maybe late 1980s. Um, and this was from Jane Owen. All right, so first, you know, what are we gonna talk about in this presentation? Well, one, you know, where is the herb number two mine? So where is this located in Virginia? For those that are maybe watching that aren't from Virginia or they're not familiar with Powhatan County, we'll learn a little bit about the location. Of course, we wanna talk about the geology and mineralogy of the herb number two. Now, again, we're not trying to just hone in on geology and mineralogy here, but I think it's important for us to have a foundation and a framework to kind of understand what's going on with these pegmatites. Of course, we wanna spend a lot of time talking about the history of the herb number two. Of course, that's the focus of the Virginia Mineral Project. We do wanna look at the topaz discovery itself and kind of give some dedication to that because that is one of the most well-known and top discoveries here at the herb number two. We also wanna talk about the cassiterite discovery. A lot of people maybe don't really know about this discovery, not as well reported, but it was found a year after the topaz. We also wanna talk about the first US occurrence of wagenite. So this was an important kind of note in, in research um, that was done here at the herb number two. It's very important. We also want to focus on Amelia versus Powhatan pegmatite. You know, what's the difference between Amelia and Powhatan County? Because when we think of Amelia, that's where we normally think about when we look at pegmatites in Virginia. So why do we overlook Powhatan? Why, if Powhatan has these incredible discoveries, do we sometimes forget about it? We also want to talk about areas for further research. Well, this is very important because there's a lot that we don't know, a lot of things that we still need to do. So I want to continue that. And then we'll end um, with a Q&A session for those that are actually here for the presentation. But um, if you have questions, feel free to put them on YouTube or you can email us at virginiamineralproject at gmail.com. So please feel free to send us any questions. I do want to make a disclaimer that the Herb Number 2 mine has been reclaimed. It's on private property now. So the main focus of this presentation is for historical use. This is not about collecting at the herb two currently. It is about the historical implications and history of the herb itself. And the photograph that you see over here to the right is very interesting, partly because this is what you see, or the public anyways, when you actually try to look up the topaz discovery. This is the only photograph that really exists on the public domain side of things. And so we can see that Although these historical black and white photographs are important, um, they don't really showcase the incredible discovery and the significance of the topaz itself, not just for Virginia, but for the entire continent of North America. And of course, this is in the 1990s Minerals of Virginia publication by R.V. Dietrich. Um, so that's you know, the focus of why we do the Virginia Mineral Project. All right. So where is the Herb Number 2 mine? Well, the Herb Number 2 mine is in the eastern part of Powhatan County. Uh, we can see over here, if we look to our right, this is Powhatan County, and this is the map of Virginia. So we can see that it's located in the Piedmont province. Um, we can also see that, I don't know, for me, I always think that Powhatan looks like an arrowhead in a way, right? Almost looks like an arrowhead. Um, the star is actually where the Herb Number 2 is located in Powhatan County. So you can see it's right off of Route 60. Um, Powhatan borders Amelia, Chesterfield, Cumberland, and Goochland counties. So Goochland at the top, Cumberland to the side, Amelia to the south, and Chesterfield to the, to the east. Now, a lot of these counties also have significant, you know, mineral deposits and history. Of course, Amelia, a very famous, you know, county for the pegmatites in Virginia. And then Chesterfield, in 2019, we discovered that the green giant, the green barrel crystal that was about 11 and a half inches long from the Dale Quarry. So again, everything really in this area is situated in a very unique mineralogical um, deposit. Now, again, this is near the Flat Rock area, so that's the area that is considered. You'll see that name kind of talked about a lot when you look up the herb number two. 
Um, population, you know, it's a very small place. So 29,000 people, almost 30,000 people. That was done in 2019. And then a fun fact, I mean, you've probably noticed, hey, Palatan sounds very familiar. Where did I hear that? Well, it was named after Chief Palatan, who was a powerful chief from the Tidewater region. And of course, is the father of the Indian princess Pocahontas. So a little bit of historical background there and fun fact. All right, so let's talk a lot about the geology of the herb number two. Now, again, when we're talking about this, I'm not wanting to get too much into the weeds, but I think it is important for us to have kind of a foundational understanding of the geology and the mineralogy. So for the host rock that this pegmatite is intruding, it's under the state farm nice. So when we're looking in the area and we're looking for the state farm nice, that is where this pegmatite is located. It is Proterozoic Y in age. So that comes around, you know, 1.031 billion years old. This is rubidium strontium data testing. Um, again, this is not a herb study specifically, but pegmatite analysis from the Amelia district, or what's also called the Amelia pegmatite district of rubidium and strontium dating of biotite and muscovite actually indicated an age range from 261 to 289 million years. Um, this was done in 1962, so that's late Permian. And so, of course, this is very important because we're looking at late Permian going into Triassic when you start seeing a lot of the rift basins and separation of Pangaea. So really important as these pegmatites are intruding because of the volcanic activity going on around this time. Um, of course, like many of the pegmatites in Virginia, it's part of a northeast trending belt. It is also lenticular in shape. You can think of a lentil bean, but if you are lentil. Uh, if you want to think of something else, think of like a s flying spaceship or a, a flying saucer um, where it kind of peters out of the ends, but it has a kind of a bulge in the middle. Uh, it's striking north 20 degrees to the east and it dips steeply to the east. Its maximum thickness is 40 feet and it's around 240 feet long. And the one kind of exception that we see compared to the Amelia pegmatite is that it's deeply weathered. And so this comes up a lot in discussions regarding mineral collecting and the longevity of the location, why it may not be as recorded as much as Amelia was. But a lot of the stuff here is deeply weathered. And so that impacts a lot of what we're seeing and a lot of this collection that was going on. Over here to the right is actually a really interesting um, diagram. It's a block diagram that's showing idealized relations between these common zones uh, fracture fillings and replacement bodies within Virginia's pegmatites. And this was from Brown 1962 and his Micah and Feldspar deposits book, which is a must read and we'll be talking more about it. Um, what we're seeing here is we're trying to just get a very idealized understanding of different parts of a pegmatite. So we see we have like a border zone, a wall zone, an intermediate zone, the core, these replacement bodies, and these fracture fillings. Why is this important? Well, it's important because when we're looking at a pegmatite and you're looking at the articles and the literature on these pegmatites, you're going to see things that are going to denote um, certain minerals and certain discoveries to certain parts of the pegmatite. So it may say that, as we can see in this graph, the intermediate zone has coarse to very coarse grain, uh, perthite, plagioclase, and quartz. So again, each zone has different mineralogy and different things that are going on with it. So when you're reading this literature and you're looking at, oh, what does wall zone mean? What does intermediate zone mean? What does the core mean? Well, we just want to be able to go back and reference this and kind of have an understanding of where it's at in the pegmatite. And we'll have a few more photographs here in a second of that. Uh, this is a geology map, uh, or very generalized geology map of Powhatan County. Uh, this is uh, done in August 2017, but the data itself is from uh, the 1993 geologic map of Virginia. Um, it's an interesting map. There's some kind of distortions here. You know, if we go back over to our map here, we can see that um, in reality, right here is where the, the herb number two is located. Um, and so in this map, it's kind of pushed over to the west and more up north. Um, when you look and you overlay this with the interactive geology map on the DMME's website, you will see that this is, in fact, this mica um, node right here in this X is actually the herb number two. So this is on this map. That's where it's showing it. Um, and we can see that it's in the State Farm Nice, but it's right up next to this garnet biotite nice that we see here in the kind of orange uh, color. 
Um, this is Lake Shawnee here, and that's right next to the Flat Rock Granite. So again, we're in this Flat Rock area. Um, but yeah, but mica is what it's being denoted on this general geology map. We also see that we have a luckstone quarry here, which is really interesting too. They're digging not in the gneiss or the granites here. They're actually in this myelinite of the Hylas Fault Zone, which is really interesting. And then what's really cool, because we talked again about Triassic Rift Basins and these things going on in Pangaea, is you actually see right not far away from this pegmatite body, um, you have a Triassic Rift Basin and these Triassic sandstone shells and coals, which are really, really cool to see. So Palatan really has a very unique, you know, diversity of geologic deposits. So it's really, really interesting um, to look at this map. And then, of course, we can see there's all these other mineral deposits here um, denoted on this map as well. Now, this is my favorite uh, map. And this, this is a geologic section, a map of geologic sections of the Herb Number 2 itself. And this was done in 1944. Uh, of course, we can see down here at the lower right, it was revised in 44 and 45. I mean, but what this is showing us is this is trying to give an understanding of where things are located in the Herb Number 2 pegmatite. What's really cool about this is that the mica and feldspar deposits book by um, uh, Dr. Brown from 1962, if you get a good copy of it, will have, with all of the deposits it's talking about, these types of maps. So for collectors, it's very useful. For geologists, of course, very useful. And for mineralogists, very useful. I mean, it gives us really a good understanding of the pegmatite as it was being discovered from what they were finding. Um, so what we see here, we see multiple trenches. So we can see there's one up here, two, three, four. We'll learn about a fifth one that was dug across here. But this one right here has turned into a very massive pit. So from C to C prime, what they were digging right here ended up being kind of the mother load or what they were focusing on. So we can see that a lot of these efforts were focused in the southern trench just due to the quality. Why? Well, if we go back to our explanation here, we can see that there's a very heavy barrel concentration. We also have um, mica that's being formed as well as here, scrap mica. The quality here wasn't as, as great as they'd like it to have been. So you got scrap mica, you got barrel, and those are going to be your economic minerals that that are going to focus on why you're digging here at the herb number two. Uh, so a really interesting map with a lot of interesting information. Um, one thing that's a little bit confusing here is the way that they've drawn this. We It looks like it's actually dipping to the west, when in reality it's dipping to the east, but they've switched the C to C prime. It's kind of backwards here. We can see it's C prime to C instead of C to C prime. Um, but another map will kind of revert that to get us kind of a better understanding here in a second. And again, this is that map. So we can see now it's trending to the east. We get a good idea from C to C prime. Uh, this is, of course, a more detailed map. Uh, what's interesting about these maps, too, for a collector's perspective, um, unfortunately, most of these places are reclaimed now or shut down or on private property. But these maps were very useful for, for prospectors because it showed the dump piles. Not only the dump piles, but when you when you take the dump piles and you look at where they're located and what's being found in these cross sections here, you can actually say, like we see here from C, C to C prime, that there's a lot of barrel being concentrated here. So if you're going to collect and you're looking, you're like, hey, this is going to be the barrel pit. This is going to be where they were discovering all the barrel in the deposit. So it gives you a good idea. You can actually see that there's this barrel concentration here, these kind of black little uh, rectangles. So you see sm scrap mica uh, concentration, massive quartz, you know, here we see pegmatite rich in coarse blocky perthite, which is green in color, so that's amazonite. So again, very, very useful maps for collectors. Um, we can also see a little bit more information here as far as the depth of the dump piles. So we can see multiple layers is showing us that there's around, you know, three levels of these dump piles. Um, these are also a little bit more um, sophisticated in these drawings as well. Um, and of course, this is in the mica deposit of the southeastern Piedmont, which is part four of that uh, series, which is the outline deposits in Virginia. And that's from the Department of Interior in 1953. But if we look at the bottom, it's still 1944 being mapped. Now, I do wanna say here, thank you and a special shout out to Eric Grandel who provided me with a lot of photographs from the Herb Number 2 and his time there in 1980. But Eric didn't just give me photographs. Eric provided me with incredible um, photographs that actually are trying to superimpose the photograph on top of these trench, these original test pits and trenches 
in relation to these, you know, Department of Interior and DMME mapping projects. So here we can see that this is what he considered the Columbite pit, which is B to B prime. And so we can actually see that this trench right here that he's photographing is the trench that we're seeing in this photograph, which is really, really cool. Um, so incredible to see this. It's also really uh, interesting. These, these photographs were done on a 35 millimeter uh, lens or 35 millimeter slide. So I've actually had to just put this up to the light, use my camera phone to get these photographs. So some of them came out pretty nicely. And then here we can really see um, this is the barrel dump, right? So this is to the right side or to the left side of what we're looking at right now um, on this map. And we can see what he's talking about here are these multiple layers. Um, and then we can say, okay, sure. We see that there's all this massive quartz. That's where the barrel is being concentrated around the core zone here. Um, and then it's being dumped over to the left, some to the right, and then some, of course, in this tailing pile here. So as a collector, very, very important. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the mineralogy of the herb number two. And this is when we want to get into these different zones because this is from the 1962 Brown report. And we'll see what I mean when I say the way he's describing it relates back to these zones of a pegmatite. Um, over here to the right is actually a really uh, interesting generalized zone of a pegmatite. Um, we can see what we're talking about here. We had this core zone. We have a core margin. That's where you possibly find these large crystals of topaz, barrel, and tourmaline. No tourmaline in the herb number two. Of course, this is not our pegmatite, but it's useful to kind of understand. Uh, we see an albite zone, a wall zone, and the border zone, right? So again, pegmatites are different. They're all unique, but you can get these kind of common terminology that you're seeing when people describe it. So the first thing that we see, and we start out with the kind of core zone itself, is that Brown denotes that there's a discontinuous core. So there's kind of multiple cores, a massive quartz lenses that are one to five foot thick and 10 to 25 foot long. And that's surrounded by an intermediate zone of coarse blocky green perthite, which is, of course, Amazonite, and flesh color to reddish perthite. The wall zone is around two to four foot thick. It appears to have been medium to coarse grain aggregate of perthite quartz and possibly plagioclase. Much of that material, though, as we said previously, has been corroded. And in a lot of ways, it's been almost completely replaced by albite, um, albite variation Clevelandite in this case, um, which of course is occurring as fine grained sugary textured aggregates or, or clusters of platy Clevelandite crystals. And then the mica garnet and barrel, um, very interesting because I have not seen any specimens of the garnet. That's one of the things that we still need to kind of find. Um, <clears throat> But they're forming in this partially albatized perthite, <coughs> excuse me, it's adjacent to the quartz masses. So again, I go back to our photographs here. We can see how these things are kind of overlaying, not perfectly, but you can see how the terminology is being used. Uh, down here to the right, this is the Stewart pegmatite um, in California. And I'm not wanting to do too much comparison here, but what I do want to show, this is a great image from a research paper on episodes of fast crystal growth and pegmatites from 2020. A really good article. I would highly recommend you checking out. We can also see that the person down here is two meters. So this is a fairly large uh, pegmatite. Um, but what you see is you can see all these different zones that it's talking about. But one thing that I do want to point out is these uh, myrolytic cavities. And these are important because these are the cavities that are producing a lot of those gem pockets that we see in the mineral community where you have all these tourmalines and smoky quartz and all those nice crystals forming are in these myrolytic cavities. So a very important part of the pegmatite for mineral collectors. And then of course you have these perthite zones with chimneys. Some of these chimneys, they'll come back into play and we'll hear about that later in regards to the cassiterite discovery itself. All right, so now let's look at the mineralogy uh, continued here. Um, we have small lustrous tabular to equant crystals of columbite tantalite that are scattered through the albatized wall zone of the pegmatite. And of course, they're particularly abundant along the hanging wall opposite to the northeast quartz mass in the pit. So again, getting a little bit into the weeds here, but if you're looking at your pegmatite chart and you're looking at the herb map and you're using these indicators, it gives you a really good idea of where things are kind of located. So very useful for a collector. Um, the mica itself is a yellowish green to cinnamon brown. It's poor quality here. Many of the books are soft, buckled, broken, and clay stained. So again, you'll hear them say 
um, it's scrap mica. That's what they'll con that's what they'll consider it. Um, here is a an updated 2021 list of reported minerals from the herb. Uh, this is a very interesting list. Um, not because some of the minerals here are odd, but because many of them have never been photographed or I've never seen specimens in collections. So there's a lot to kind of look. We can see that, of course, beryl, cassiterite, topaz, wagenite, um, albite variation, clevelandite. Of course, this is not like Moorfield or uh, Rutherford. Again, this is all kind of weathered, um, degrade, um, weathered, corroded material. Um, we also see other beryllium minerals here. We also have um, one thing that's interesting that I thought was the simple highlight. Um, you know, opal is an interesting one, and then highlights, very interesting to see from here. Spessartine, though, and zircon and monazite, these are things that we think of when we think of um, the, uh, the Rutherford mine, but we don't see anything here. I mean, I haven't seen any photographs, so it would be very interesting to kind of look at what's the difference between the spessartines from here, the monazites from here, and the zircons compared to uh, the, the Rutherford prospect and the uh, Moorfield mine. So something that's really interesting that still needs to be worked on. Um, we also see here, this is this perfect example of the barrel crystals from here. And then this is that sugary, fine grained uh, albite Clevelandite that you're seeing, it's all corroded. And you can see that there's some kind of platy surface textures here where the, they were growing on top of it at once, but they've all kind of weathered away right now. Um, this image over to the right is really interesting. It's kind of a lot. This was in the Lapidary Journal and written by Pete McCreary. This is supposed to be a very stylized version of the um, topaz that we'll be talking about here in a second. And what this is showing is it's showing the topaz as it was supposed to be in situ. Now, how they assumed it was vertical compared to horizontal or any of that, I don't know if they could really have done that, but what it's trying to show you though is that you have this topaz crystal that as it's getting down to the lower right, it's actually weathering away into like a sericite clay as they were, that they were denoting it as, uh, very interesting. I uh, also talked about Clevelandite growing on the sides here. We can see these kind of crystal faces here and as it's kind of corroding the topaz and he called it tapioca pudding. It's kind of the way that he described it. We also see like a myrolytic cavity here, a uh, root supposed to be growing into it. Again, how they got to this, I'm not quite sure. Um, these are supposed to be platy Clevelandite crystals. This is supposed to be an Amazonite crystal. Um, this is supposed to be kind of a broken up Wagenite crystal. These are mica books. And then this is supposed to be a bleb of smoky quartz. And these two th sections you see right here are cross sections of that crystal at that given place. So this is supposed to be right here. That's the cross section of it. And then right here, as you can see, it's kind of corroding and, and, and um, replacing and decomposing. But OK, so let's now talk about the history. This is the part that everyone wants to hear about, because this is what we really don't have a lot of information about. There's not a lot out there. So a lot of the Virginia Mineral Project has been trying to collect and bring back this history for the public. So a lot of this that you're going to hear is going to be new information that may not necessarily be out there um, on the web or easily accessible. So we start in 1944 with the original exploration by Carl Fleming of Colonial Homes, Inc. of Richmond. Uh, and this was when the herb was first explored. Now, Unfortunately, I try to go back and find any information about this. I couldn't, um, but I still need to do some more investigations to see if I can learn more about this old company and why Colonial Homes was involved in this exploration. We also denote the time here in 1944, so we're still in World War II. So, you know, there's a lot of strategic things going on. A lot of mineral collecting, or not even mineral collecting, but mineral exploration in Virginia was being done during World War II. Um, so very important for our state in that time frame. Um, the workings are considered what's known as dragline excavations. Again, we can think of it like the single one trench. So they're just putting out their kind of backhoe and they're taking one and they're dragging it across. So it's one single excavation. You see these four deep trenches dug across the pegmatite and then a fifth following the northern direction of the pegmatite. And so we'll see a photograph um, of that and we'll go back to the map here in a second. Uh, the two southernmost trenches were partly destroyed by ladder cut, uh, later cut. Um, which is 125 foot long, 20 to 40 foot wide, and 20 foot at maximum depth. And so that's that bigger one that we'll see. And like I said, we'll come back to that here in a second. A little bit of sheet mica, several tons of scrap mica, and about two tons of barrel um, were reported to have been obtained during the mining process. So that's pretty much what they got. Um, while mining, um, we hit our first giant. And so in 1944, Fleming actually recovers 
a broken barrel crystal about five foot long and 27 inches thick. Now that's massive. Um, and he also finds a part of another one, which weighs approximately 300 pounds, and that one's around 14 by 20 inches. Um, and unfortunately, the five foot long, <laughs> five feet one, um, five feet long crystal did not survive. Um, that was never preserved, but the 300 pound crystal was actually preserved and went on display at the DMME or our state survey. And so the five foot long one uh, is what we would consider to be the largest barrel crystal ever discovered in Virginia. Um, this is a photograph in uh, the Minerals of Virginia publication by Dietrich in 1990. Um, and again, black and white, but this is showing us what the barrel crystal looked like. Um, it is the one that we're talking about here. Um, the one at the top is actually from Pete McCreary's collection, and it's just giving you kind of an idea of what it looks like in a colorized format. A lot of the barrel here was also kind of a, like a milky light blue, so almost like aquamarine. Some of it was different colors, but a lot of it was blue here as well. Now here we go back to the map. So. We looked at it earlier, but now with this history, you get a little bit better of an understanding. So we see one, two, three, four trenches. We have one trench to the direction of the north of the pegmatite, right? So it's going northeast. And we can see that three and four are pretty much gone. Three is now at the top of this. Five still there in, a, in pretty good detail, but four is completely gone and it's turned into what we see is the, the most important test trench of the site. So again, as we're piecing these things back together, we can see that C is really um, what brought attention to the pegmatite and why they ended up mining it. All right, so continuing this, the property eventually comes under the ownership of Mr. Byers and that was leased um, by a hunting club. And so we see that a lot in Virginia. A lot of hunting clubs lease the land of these big properties, and then mineral collectors have tried to work things out with the, with the property owners and the hunting clubs to gain access to certain parts of the year. Of course, it was restricted to collecting on Sundays because you couldn't hunt on Sundays at that time, and it was only two Sundays a year which collectors were allowed to come. And now this was a very small group of collectors. Um, here over to the right, we see this is Don and Jay. Um, and they're digging here. This is 1980. Now, I'm questioning here because this is another Eric Randell's uh, photograph, but if this is Don Richardson, who will become an important player here in a second that we'll talk more about, um, but we can see this is 1980. So this property under the ownership of Mr. Byers was in the 70s, more than likely. Um, kept very low key. Um, it was Pete McCreary, W.T. Bill Neal, uh, and Howard Freeland. You'll see a lot of his photographs in a lot of the DMME's publications. And so Pete denotes this as being kind of a very secret operation. They didn't want people to ruin what was happening here. So for many years, it was kind of kept under wraps. So we've moved from the 40s of exploration all the way now to the 70s, right? So there's a gap kind of between that. Again, specimens at this time that they were finding were blue barrel, a large topaz cross section. Unfortunately, no photographs of that. Amazonite and columbite. And then... We don't know if they were finding wagonite at this time. We'd probably assume they were, but they didn't know it existed at this time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Mr. Byers eventually passes away. The property was then purchased by what was called the Powhatan Land Company, or PLC. And this is in the beginning of the 1980s. And so again, this is a photograph from a trip in October 1980. Um, this is Amazonite. So this is that green perthite that they're talking about. And we can see that very different from uh, the Amazonite found at Moorfield and found at Rutherford. So it's a very unique type of Amazonite. It looks very different. Uh, and it's really weathered. It almost looks corroded in a way. I mean, it doesn't look as nice as the other locations in Amelia. So that goes back to this kind of corroded, weathered um, pegmatite that is noted in the literature. And of course, this is a specimen from Giannini in 1986. All right, so by 1981, things changed. So Donald Richardson, who's a member of the PLC, was supposedly out on the site and ended up coming across this green material, which we now know is Amazonite. It piqued his interest. And so in the literature, it says he rediscovered in 1981. Well, we do see that in the past in the photograph we just saw that there was a gentleman named Don with the collecting crew in 1980. So this could be kind of one of those things that we see often in the stories 
that timelines maybe don't match up and there's a lot of different people. Sometimes collectors think they're the only ones going to this site. So could be that 1980 was the time it was rediscovered. But again, early 1980, either 80, 81. Now, he took some local collector, uh, he took this material, this Amazonite, to local collectors into the rock shops, right? A lot of people do that. Mineral communities have been a great option, and so have rock shops to get things identified. So he took it out there, said, what is this? And he ended up doing a small excavation, which unfortunately was non-productive or unproductive. Um, in 1982, Pete comes back on the scene. So again, these older photographs are from Eric Rendell, but Pete's like, you know, you need to do digging in a different way at different parts of the pegmatite, right? I don't think Don really understood where he was digging in the pegmatite. So unless you looked at those maps and kind of understood how to work all that, you wanted to know exactly where to dig. Um, so a new attempt was made on a cold rainy day in March of 1982. Pete was there, his friends, Don and other members of the PLC. Uh, Pete first met at Don's uh, property. Um, they brought some specimens from Rutherford and Moorfield to kind of showcase what had been found in Amelia. Um, and during this heavy rain, uh, rain they um, decided to re-excavate the site. And so they focused on the east to west cross trenches and then just north of the main north-south trench. So they were focused on kind of an un, a zone that had not really been focused on at the northern part of the pegmatite. And then this is where things kind of get a little bit tricky. So a loose agreement was made um, on the sales of mineral production here. And so Pete and Don made an agreement that it'd be split 50-50. So whatever was found, 50 would go to Pete, 50 would go to Don. Now how this transpired over time and how that all worked, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's kind of where it's left at this point. Um, this is a really cool photograph because this is showing this uh, C2C dragline excavation, of course, destroyed by that larger pit. All this has been filled in. Of course, this is all tailings. Um, and this is a really cool Amazonite crystal that was found by David Dinsmore in the 1980s when he went collecting there. So a really cool Amazonite crystal itself. Um, these are some more photographs. So of course, on the left here, this is the quartz boulder uh, that's right next to the barrel dump. So this is really interesting because we can actually kind of identify where this was at the herb. So we, we can see that it's on the right side if we're looking at that one map looking out. So this boulder is pointing out towards the screen. And if you're looking at it where you'll be at, which is on the other side of the screen, would be where the barrel dump is located. So right here to the left. So you're looking to the to the east. Um, and of course, they were trying to move that very large boulder. So that was Don and Jay after flipping that boulder in 1980. So again, things get a little bit iffy here because things start getting um, stated that there's these discussions that are going on where there's a lot of monetary interest by the PLC, so they don't really care too much about the minerals. They care about making profit off the land that's not necessarily development, but it's actually mineral resources. Like, hey, this is kind of cool. Um, P. McCreary writes in the Lapidary Journal that, you know, he felt that these were the primary interest of why the PLC was actually engaging with the mineral community on this site. During the 1980s, things end up, you know, continuing. There was collecting at the site. There's been several discoveries, which, of course, we'll talk about. There's, but a, there's a lot that's been sold off to private collections without documentation or photography. Um, a good example of this is a story from David Dinsmore when he found that uh, Amazonite crystal. And he said that he went there and there was a topaz crystal, maybe bigger than a baseball or softball, and um, a very nice crystal. But he said it was, Don wanted to sell it for $500, and he don't know where that went. So where do these things go? Whose collections are they in? That's just something that we have to deal with as we're doing research, because a lot of this stuff gets sold off privately, very secretively, kind of under the table. And then did these agreements go back to Pete? We don't know how these 50-50 monetary agreements worked out. Uh, 1983, there was actually some more excavations by Pete and Don. Uh, Rock Swap was actually held, which is really interesting. I never knew about that. Um, at the Frisbee Service Station Grocery and Restaurant on July 2nd and 3rd of 1983. And then after the rock swap, they hosted a fee trip over to the site at, on those two days. Um, things get a little bit interesting in 1984 because of the American mineralogist Mike Wise, very well-known Virginia mineralogist, uh, documents the first U.S. locality of Wajanite from the site. Um, now, 
I say the first first U.S. locality. There was another one. We'll talk about it. I think maybe they had multiple specimens, and when they determined and wrote up this research paper, it just so happened that there was like two first because they had been found kind of in a relative time frame. Um, but Pete and Don actually had recordedly um, had a Canadian mining company that came out and visited the site to do some testing, but they said that there was nothing significant found there. Pete chalked this up to... Well, they didn't look in the right place. They were looking in these kaolinized zones. They weren't actually looking in the concentrated areas where the wagenite would be discovered. Um, so again, how many people are looking at these geology maps? You think a mining company would, but again, this is Pete's kind of point to the story. Uh, the Virginia Independent Prospectors, which is kind of a branch within the Richmond Gym and Mineral Society, I mean, not really, but was part of some of the main people there under Pete McCreary, um, had access in the 1990s, but eventually it was sold and eventually, you know, it shut off to collectors. How that happened, it's a little bit fuzzy. Don't want to make any kind of, you know, factual statements about that. Someone said that someone bought the property, covered it up. Of course, there's reclamation that occurred on the site now. Um, how all that kind of transpired, we still need to learn a little bit more about. Uh, this is another photograph here of the one that we saw earlier in the presentation of the B2B prime dragline excavation. And then this is a really cool photograph from Pete of a barrel crystal that he had found um, in the, at the herd number two. Um, this is really cool because this is a drawing by Pete. I apologize, it's not of quality as well I like it to be, but this is the only drawing that we do have um, showing the herb number two and the excavations that were done by 1983. So this is what the herb looked like at its end. So this is what you would see with all these extra pits being done up here to the north. You can see that they were trying to do some in the south. They've actually drawn some kind of projections here saying that supposedly the pegmatite maybe petered out down here. They didn't find anything. Um, so it gives us a little bit more, um, an interesting understanding. So we can see that it almost confirms that the pegmatite's within this area and doesn't extend any further north or south from that. Um, but a really interesting kind of drawing here. I think this is still the barrel dump. He just moved it over to save some space. Um, and of course, it's in the Lapidary Journal. Um, again, that article is not public and it's old, so a lot of this is the first time people are seeing it. Um, over here to the right, of course, is these beautiful Amazonite uh, crystal cleave, but it is a crystal. You can see the faces on it. Um, so a really nice, beautiful specimen of Pete's collection from the herb number two. All right, so let's move forward to today. So on March 6th of this year, I took Pete out to try to see if we could rediscover the property after all these years. You know, we spend the morning looking at tax maps, GIS databases, trying to uncover and learn more about anything that we could to try to locate the old site. Um, Pete believed that the site had been developed under the PLC and was now part of a subdivision. This seemed to be a common theme where a lot of people assumed that the site ended up being developed into a subdivision. Now, I'm not going to release the name of the subdivision for privacy's sake, but that didn't actually happen. It never made it up that far. So the subdivision did not extend from what we can tell from our trip into the area where the herb was. Uh, so a really interesting kind of historical note that proved not to be the case. Um, through these tax maps and GIS records, um, we found some kind of possible sites. Um, we, we kind of located to one road that we knew it was on. We knew that whatever was happening was with one mile of this road. We just needed to figure out which house it was. Um, and so, again, we knew that it didn't make the subdivisions to not get out this far. Around 3 p.m., we actually rediscover the site. It was so exciting because this was the first time that Pete was able to step on the land where he found the largest North American topaz. Um, we talked with the property owner, gave him some information, kind of showed him about this, told him about the site and the discoveries, and it was a learning experience for him as well. And so that's the cool part is when we can go back and share these things with people and bring some more of that cultural heritage back to um, the community in Powhatan. Um, this is a really cool photograph because it's looking south. So you're at the north end of the pit. You're looking south. We see that there's the, the boulder here uh, that we saw in our earlier photographs. And of course, this is the C to C uh, drag line right down there. So this is looking south down the pit. Now, of course, this looks different because this is one a lot flatter and it's in the woods and it's wintertime, so you don't see all the brush. But this is the area that the herb is located. It may be further back in the woods here, but this is actually a, 
a test trench on this gentleman's property um, that he's filling in here um, over the years because it's kind of sinking in the land he's trying to get it. You can actually see over here to the right, uh, when we met him, uh, he was actually digging up some rocks, funny enough. And so, you know, that had been a problem for him. And so he had been putting rocks over in here to kind of like flatten the land. Um, you know, they said, yeah, we find a lot of mica. We found some green rocks. So, of course, that'd be in the Amazonite. So really exciting to kind of see that we may not be in the exact area. This, may, this is not the exact pit, of course, but we are really in an area where the herb is located. So really kind of interesting to go back and experience that. All right, so now let's talk about the topaz. So on September 14th, which was a Tuesday in 1982, Don called Pete and told him that he had a Bobcat uh, front end loader available for use at the site. So Don, Bill Neal, and Ronnie Patterson, who was Don's friend, were the diggers at the site that day. Pete ended up picking up uh, Ronnie. And Pete makes a funny note in his comments that, you know, the Bobcat is probably excellent for moving manure, or loosened soil, but a half inch tree root stops in its tracks. So they ended up moving away from the bobcat, doing their hand collecting, which probably wasn't a bad idea anyways, sort of focusing on the dumps that have been placed from that main pit. So again, the southern pit. They said after removing a 250 pound quartz border, Pete discovered a glassy gem topaz fragment, which was around one to two ounces. Um, and he felt that whenever he was finding topaz, they were associated with the green Amazonite or with Amazonite. Um, now, is that the case or is that just how it is? I don't know, but it couldn't make sense with the geology just by the description that we see from Brown. Um, but anyways, he found this topaz fragment. Now, what's really cool is that I actually have the preserved field notes from Pete from 1982. So that's what we're seeing over here. We can see that he's kind of done some very rough hand drawings here, taking down some notes documenting everything. So this is really cool because these are the original notes from the Topaz discovery. Um, he makes a comment in his Lapidary Journal article that I then swung the pick in of my genuine U.S. Army trenching shovel into the soft dump at that spot and heard a distinct click, clink. Uh, I joked, well, I just hit a giant Topaz, another magic moment for was exactly prophetic. So I'm sure, you know, you know, we've all experienced this kind of dread where we take a hammer or a shovel and we end up hitting something after not finding anything for the entire day. Um, this happens, um, but thankfully, according to Pete, uh, there was no damage to the crystal, but he ended up noticing that he found this kind of loosened end to this unknown object that to him ended up looking like a large smoky quartz crystal. Now, Bill had found that, or found a smoky quartz crystal earlier that day. And so as he's looking at the end, he's like, ah, you know, it looks like a smoky quartz crystal. Can't really tell at this point. So he tries to expose it a lot more. He's like, this is big no matter what it is. Um, he said it was too difficult to remove by hand. And so he decided to get to his car, get a screwdriver, and remove the dirt without damaging the piece. I mean, when we're digging up minerals, we want to be very, very careful. Um, over here to the right is the, one of the main photographs from his article here. Um, this is that large... Topaz giving you kind of an indication of how long it was in inches and centimeters. This is one of the photographs that was taken just a few days after the discovery uh, by Betsy Martin. And then what we can see here at the bottom, which is really interesting, I mean, as I'm doing this research, maybe I get a little bit crazy uh, and nerdy about it, but I did notice that this emblem kept showing up in this article and in other documents. And it ends up that I think this is Pete, Pete's signature. So we see the M for McCreary, Pete, the P's and then the A upside down, A for Peter A. McCreary. So this was kind of his kind of signature that he would leave in any of his drawings, uh, which was really interesting. So further exposure, he ended up beginning to realize, hey, this is not quartz, but this is topaz. Um, he said he was eventually able to wiggle it loose and pull it vertically out of the orange tan kaolin rich mica dump material. Now, maybe if he's pointed out vertically, this is where he gets the idea of that horizontal um, stylized sketch of how it actually formed. Now, of course, if it's in dump material, there's no way you're going to get any sort of in situ understanding of how it was oriented in the, in the actual pegmatite itself. But maybe that's where some of the inspiration came from. Um, things get complicated here because it was said that the topaz uh, was sold. For $1,000, now it could be $2,000, could be $1,000. That's where stories kind of get intermingled and we need to learn a little bit more. 
Um, but it was said to have been sold to the Wilkinson's Rock Shop in Richmond on that a lot of people kind of know about from the Richmond Club area. Um, eventually, a dealer in West Virginia negotiated a deal with the Bob Campbell Museum at Clemson University. Um, and it was sold for 12000 to the Bob Campbell Museum. 1000 of that was given to the negotiator. And then all these pieces that we see on the lower right here was actually given over to the, uh, the Bob Campbell Museum. And so that is where the topaz sits today. For a long time, it was not on display after it was purchased. So really, this has come in display maybe in the last five to 10 years. So a really interesting kind of place to see it because the Bob Campbell Museum in Clemson, of course, is South Carolina. So it's no longer in Virginia, um, but a really kind of interesting um, transition over those years. I'm up at the top here is a photograph from Eric Rendell. This is not the Topaz discovery, but I think it gets us in the mood of this kind of story as they're digging and exploring. You see uh, Ray and Don here uh, digging into the pegmatite and the tailings and trying to find something. Now the description of the topaz, this is where things get really interesting. So here we see Pete over to the right with his topaz crystal, um, holding it like a baby, very special find. Um, you can see it's very, very large. It's got a lot of heft to it too. It's not just large in length, but very wide. Um, I also got his Richmond Gem and Mineral Society badge right here as well. Um, and this is how he describes it. So the topaz was jimmy, virtually flawless, and had a very pale blue interior. Hard to see it here, but we'll notice it in some future photographs. Um, had a moving gas bubble, which is really cool. It ended up being like carbon dioxide uh, filled, and it had some other fluid filled cavities as well, so in hydros. Um, broken surfaces on one inch seemed to be from the 1944 to 1945 excavation. Um, it was weighed in at 8.95 pounds, that's 20,298 carats, which is the largest recorded topaz in North America. It was 10.95 inches in length along the C-axis, 3.65 inches along the B-axis, and 3.112 inches on the A-axis. So again, a very, very large topaz. And the last 3.5 inches or so under this termination, it was actually decorated with an even white dusty phantom zone. So there was actually some phantoms going on in it, which is really cool. He makes a comment that it detracts from its faceting potential, but you know, you don't want to facet this thing. This is an incredible specimen. You don't want it to be cut up. Um, the smaller pieces that we saw earlier, they were, they were broken, but partially recrystallized. So it's actually been some time. These things weren't just recently broken. Um, Two of them were ended up getting faceted, but one remains a rough piece, and we'll see a photograph of that in a second. Again, this is another kind of image of the uh, smaller piece from the discovery. This is actually on September 15th, so um, there's a couple of days, for a period that he was actually collecting. Went back out to the site for several days to see if anything else could be found in that spot. Rightfully so, I think we would all do that. Um, this is really cool because this is also the original story in the collecting bag, which is a newsletter from the Richmond Gym and Mineral Society. So I would say, you know, pause the video and uh, look at this because this is really cool to kind of read this um, as you would have been reading it in when it was discovered in 1982. And of course it was in October of 1982 this was released. And then here's a photograph from the Bob Campbell Museum on the left so we can see what's what it is now. Two of those smaller pieces have been drastically reduced. They're faceted, but look how clear they are. You have one rough piece left, and then you have the long crystal. Now, again, there's lots of alteration and decomposition going on and kind of corroded material. That's that tapioca he's talking about. I don't think anyone's ever tried to clean it. I mean, clearly we can see here to the right, this was, you know, on a display at the Richmond Gym and Mineral Society, um, that it hasn't really been attempted to be cleaned or, or worked on since it was discovered. So it's kind of in its in natural form since 1982. So how it would look, could it clean up? We don't know because we don't know if it's, you know, has the ability to be cleaned up. Um, this is what it looks like now. So this is actually at the Bob Campbell Museum. It's on display here. We can see there's a nice little plaque right here that talks a little bit about the story, you know, liquid inclusions, carbon dioxide, when it was found. Um, What's really cool is that we see this large crystal here. You can get the blue though, especially with this piece, right? So you can see it's got that blue tint and you can see it kind of here. Hard to notice sometimes because it looks very like clear, um, but you can see some of that pale blue in the topaz itself. Okay, so let's talk about this cassiterite discovery. So 
I think with all great stories at the Herb, it started with Don calling Pete, seems to be the case. So on April 3rd, um, Don calls Pete uh, to tell him that he found an unknown crystal that day in the same area uh, Amazonite and Topaz had been discovered, so kind of in the same zone. Um, he called it, he said that it was in a downward extending chimney of gray cirrusitic mica clay that Don collected the specimen. So it goes back to what we were looking at the pegmatites earlier with that kind of chimney um, zone that was talking about. Um, it ended up being a 2.16 pound considerate crystal measuring 10 by 8 by 8 centimeters. And that is also the largest considerate crystal in North America. So at this point, we really have the largest considerate in North America, the largest topaz in North America, and the largest barrel crystal in Virginia. So again, we can now see why it's the land of the giants. Um, according to Lance Kearns, he visited the property in 1983. Don offered to sell it for $1,000. At this time, Lance did not have the Mitchell Memorial Fund, which is the main fund that Lance Kearns and James Madison University used to acquire its Virginia mineral collection. Dr. Mitchell passed away in 1989. His memorial is in the 1990 R.B. Dietrich book, Minerals of Virginia, and he left over a lot of money for Lance to purchase Virginia mineral specimens to preserve. Um, and according to Lance, ownership changed from Don Richardson to Larry Conklin to Richard Gaines and then to Victor Yunt. And each hand that it transitioned, and we see this in the mineral community quite often, it raised up $1,000. So by the time the JMU ended up purchasing it from Victor Yunt, it was $4,000. All right, so now let's look at the first U.S. occurrence of Wajanite uh, from the article from 1984. So first described in 1963 um, from the Western Pegmatite, or Western Australia's Pegmatite, Wajina Pegmatite, um, Wajanite, that's the type of locality for it. Um, it is a tantalum ore, so it's very similar in the, as far as being a tantalum ore like columbite. Um, it occurs as black sub, subhedral grains. Um, and it's in, you know, the pegma type, but again, it's not forming these nice crystallized faces. Uh, it ranged from 0.5 centimeters to 6 centimeters in length. Uh, it was the largest reported to be 13 centimeters in length, which is crazy size. Heck, we may even have the largest wagenite. Uh, in the world or maybe in North America, but we don't know because we don't have these things preserved, which is very unfortunate. Um, the official analysis was done by Mike Wise in 1984, and of course he reported as the first U.S. locality, but that was alongside the peerless pegmatite uh, in South Dakota. And then today we see around 16 locations in the U.S. that have reported um, discoveries of wagenite. And then again, as I said before, Pete said that he had a Canadian company come down and explore the Wajanite prospect, but they didn't really find anything of economic interest. Um, this is a really nice photograph from uh, Rudy. Um, you can see this is a really nice, showing some nice crystallized faces there on the Wajanite from the herb number two. Um, the photograph on the right is not, lower right is not the herb number two. It's from the Djibouti claim in Brazil, but it kind of gives you a good indication of how it looks very different from the columbite. But if you're finding these things in broken masses, how do you tell out in the field? It's just very difficult to do. So, you know, really it was all those, excuse me, all those years that they didn't find it. That's the main reason why it's very difficult to kind of differentiate. Okay. And before we end our presentation, I want to go over two last things. So first, which is why do we think of Amelia pegmatites when we think of Virginia? but we don't think of the herb number two or the pegmatites in Powhatan County. Well, I think that we do this because for a lot of reasons, the herb number two was a private location for many years, right? We had this original exploration, 20 years of kind of, you know, nothingness, 70s, all secretive, 80s, short collecting, but all under the guise of just a small community of people. Only two or few couple public sites, years later a few, and then it's gone. So I think for many reasons, a lot of this is not well known because the Moorfield had all the school trips, the Rutherford had all these research projects and public engagement, open to the public Labor Day shows. So it's really something that comes back to access, publicity, and longevity. It was often, again, kept on this low profile status. It was not a public site like the Moorfield. 
it, the product productivity was limited because of all this weathered and decomposed material. There wasn't tons of mineral collecting. You had these record breakers, right? But you didn't have a lot of specimens that weren't record breakers. So it didn't have a mass distribution out into the mineral community for people to kind of know and keep in their brain over 50 years, hey, this still exists. Despite this uncanny resemblance in many ways, again, that decomposed um, and whether pegmatite had an impact on it. And so again, we don't see many of these specimens as much in collections. I mean, heck, it is hard to find Virginia mineral specimens in collections, let alone herb number two, almost impossible. Um, this is really cool because this is a specimen that I have from the herb number two. And this is really interesting because it's almost got like a flat zone of like a fault. Um, and what you can see here is like a slip plane where you have this Amazonite that's kind of been all brecciated broken up, pushed upwards. So all this has kind of like been bulldozed up on, uh, on this flat area here. Um, and you can see that the Amazonite's really decomposed. It's weather, it's kind of, you know, all bright white. It's not very nice and colored. So it's very different than what you normally see from the other pigmatites uh, across Virginia, like Rutherford and Moorfield. Um, this is another photograph showing you that brecciation. You can see some quartz crystals actually forming here, which is really, really cool. Um, so a really nice specimen. All right, so lastly, areas for further research. So there's several stories of the herb that have been discovered and sold by Don on the side. You know, where do these pieces go? Were they ever reported and recorded and photographed? I want to try to discover those and find those. Um, I also want to try to understand and get a better idea of how we can differentiate between the number one and number two. Of course, I didn't talk about the number one because it wasn't as significant, um, but it's like other deposits, like the Rutherford. There's the Rutherford one, two, and three. Well, the three didn't really produce much, but one also has some specertine and some nice specimens. So how do we figure out where they come from than just, okay, they're found in the tailings and it's Rutherford. I think it's important for mineral collectors to differentiate and maybe be able to distinguish these things from different locations. How does this 13 centimeter reported wagenite specimen compare to other world localities? Is that also the largest specimen in the U.S. and we just don't know it? Again, hard to get that information, but worth researching. Um, I want to get more updated in professional photography of the topaz and the cassiterite. The images are great historically, but they're not for publication quality. Um, and then of course, it's important for us to find collections that have spessartine, columbite crystals, amazonite crystals, monazites, zircons, microlites were even reported there, but we just don't have any photographs. So there's a lot that's still missing that we really want to try to find and get information on. And so there's a lot that's really left out there. I've learned a lot. I've gained a lot of information on the herb. A lot of what you've seen tonight has been pieced together over a year of research very little information out there for the public to access this besides those old documents. Um, but a lot of these stories have been lost in time. And so there's a lot of things that need to be photographed, confirmed, and verified for the herb number two. All right. And with that, I'm going to end this presentation. Uh, this is two rock hounds relaxing outside after a trip, a long day of digging at the herb number two mine. Um, and so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to post it in the YouTube comments. Uh, and you can also send us an email, like I said, at virginiamineralproject at gmail.com. And until next time, I will see you later.